So I'm going to turn to a couple of specific judging questions. And Connie, one of the questions that I received in an email was, are there any differences um, in assigning a virtual meet? I would assume that everyone is, is going to be assigned the same way they were assigned to um, to live competitions, that you your each state has their own way of having the judge uh, indicate their availability um, so that your the state assigners know who who is available. Um, there may be some people that don't want to do live meets at all and would want to, want to do only virtual meets for a while. So um, I guess the uh, individual state judging directors would need to kind of poll their uh, judges to see who would be interested in, in actually being assigned to a virtual competition. And uh, then the assignments would be made as they normally would be made based on what the, what the levels are for in, in that competition and, and who's eligible to judge those levels. And so what would be some of the factors that would make a judge decide that they maybe should not do a virtual meet? I'll tell you, Cookie, we've had several um, experiences um, with mock meets with the judges and we put them through, you know, all the chores and tasks and uh, some came out feeling it was easy and they were comfortable with it and some came out not feeling quite as equipped. So um, it's not so much that they wouldn't be willing to do it, but they know they need more training. So out of these trainings comes the realization of what the judge is capable of and what they're not. I would assume that if you were to go into a virtual meet, you would want some training because you just don't want to go into it cold. You just want to see what the format is like, what the video is like, that type of thing. It's possible that um, a, a judge um, may not have very good internet access depending on where they live. Okay, if the judge does not have a good Wi-Fi service, they are to talk to me to get to my handy dandy guide on how to uh, hard plug yourself into your modem. I'm gonna make a YouTube video of that, of me sneaking into my husband's den. I hope he's not around. Okay, plugging myself in, bringing the cord out to the window, pushing it in through the kitchen, and I hope this goes viral. <laughs> Absolutely. We all need to, well, I think you're talking about it. You're going to be, uh, you found that you can use an Ethernet hardwire connection. Exactly. Jane, you mentioned uh, training. What kind of training did you all do in Region 7 to get judges ready? I've had um, several states where we've gotten the NAWGJ membership together and we provided a mock meet. It takes me maybe 30, 35 minutes to go through and explain the skills, the Zoom skills, because we use Zoom, the Zoom skills that the judges need. Um, you know, and some come in and they use Zoom every day at the classroom, but they still don't know some of the skills that are, are needed to judge because they're a little different and they're things they might not use. So we go through um, some didactic and a little practice on pinning and navigating break rooms and chat rooms. And then um, we actually host the meet. And so uh, some of the states have wanted everybody to judge all the meets. Some of the states have wanted just two judges to judge the meets and the rest of the judges look, be an audience and watch. And then we usually go into breakout rooms so they have that experience of being lifted off somewhere. And then um, we let everybody judge. Bonnie, what does a judge need to have? What kind of equipment? So we had our computers that we were judging um, the routines. And then we had our iPad where we had ProScore downloaded and um, uh, there was a meeting set up ahead of time with um, a representative from ProScore and all the judges and the meet director and the meet referee involved to make sure that we could download it and we could access it. So then when it came to the day of the meet, we just very simply um, went on to ProScore and all the girls' names were there. And it was just a matter of just finding the squad and then putting the scores in. 
if you're going to use ProScore and the judges are doing it at home, I know some judges right away, oh my goodness, I have to go buy an iPad, but you, you really don't because only one of the judges on the panel needs the iPad. The second judge could easily communicate her score to the first judge through chat or verbally, and the head judge can enter both scores. Okay. Okay, so we've said that we've got to have some equipment, we've got to have good Wi-Fi capability, but I'm also thinking that we need to have an environment in which uh, the judge won't be disturbed. Okay. So where did you actually set yourself up so that you would not be disturbed while you were judging at home? Okay, well, I was in my living room um, and I can't access virtual backgrounds. So my background is China closet, but <laughs> there's no activity going on behind me. Whereas if I were on the other side of the dining room table, you would see the window, you would see my dog. So just a place where people can't see activity going on behind you. And I would think it would be important too that if you have small children or pets that like to bark or whatever they do, that's all wonderful but you either need to find a way so that they can be distracted while you're judging and not interfere with your judging, or perhaps you might want to consider that this isn't not something that you would want to do on a particular weekend because you don't have anybody to take care of your children. It's hard for little toddlers, I think, to have mom at home or dad at home sitting in a room for six or eight hours and not climb up and want to climb up and give them a hug. But this is a professional meet experience and your entire attention should be on judging. So that's another factor that I think people should, should consider as well. Can I add to that too? When the judges are judging, they should be muted and that'll help reduce any background noise. Um, but they also just take a scan of the environment that's behind you when you look in your picture. I think there's a lot of conversations going on in public schools right now about um, these kids zooming in from home and what the teachers are seeing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so just, you know, just take a quick scan if you can't do one of the virtual screens that you are in a place where you're not, you don't have anything, you know, that you don't want other people to see. All right. And I would think too, you should probably disable any sound notices that you get. Like we get emails come in and a chime goes off. So that can be distracting uh, as well. And I was even thinking that maybe you'd put something on your, if you have a doorbell, you might put a note on the doorbell, not to ring the doorbell because that would come up in, into the um, virtual meet. The meet referee is going to have a judge meeting in advance. You're covering the technical aspects and all the things that we ordinarily cover. What else do you do in a virtual meeting with judges? I think it's really important that the judges have some mechanism in case there's some kind of technical breakdown, because that's what's unique, I think, about virtual judging is there could be a technical breakdown. There's there, the, like we had a, a situation where the vault skipped. So the judges saw the roundup, they saw the landing and they didn't see the vault. So, you know, you use your rules and policies and you look at these things on a case by case basis, but I think just giving the judges some reassurance about what is available to them. So maybe if it's paired with flip 10 and they've missed a whole routine, there's an opportunity to upload it, um, who they contact. So how they contact their meet referee or the meet director. And I think that just, just gives people some confidence in case something goes wrong technically. But I think um, sharing the phone number of the meet referee would be important so you can reach that person. Um, having the phone number of your of the two judges so that you, if, you know, like at the Massachusetts clinic, we had an 8-2 start value. That needed to be a conversation. You know, it couldn't just be a, a private chat. There was too much to talk about. So having those phone numbers, you know, where you can reach out to someone if you need them is important. So this is one of the changes in the rules and policies where ordinarily we're not really supposed to be on our phones on the competition floor. Here, yeah. the phones are gonna be an important vehicle for, for communication, both in terms we can text each other or we can phone, but just for very specific meat related activities. Wait, mm -hmm. Now the all important question, what do judges wear for a virtual meet? Bonnie, I'm gonna throw that one to you. <laughs> Okay, we actually had this, um, this talk on Sunday, and it's a sanctioned event, so you should be wearing your uniform. You know, and as we said, you know, this is the part you see, so you should have on your navy jacket, you should have your white blouse, and I would think that whatever you wear below what you could see is optional. Can two judges judge together from the same location? 
I don't know if we have anything written that you cannot do that. Um, but if it is, if that happens, I would think that we have to really maintain our professionalism and, and come up with our score totally independently, no conversation between the judges and, and do what we would do in a, in a live situation. So we have to depend on the integrity of the, of the judges in, the, in that case. I don't know if they've had any thought about that in region seven. Did you have any live situation where two people were at a gym, for example? Yes. Yeah, yeah one I was there <laughs> with Jane. We were six feet apart. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's what comes to mind when you think of two people in the home, at least in our region with all the restrictions. I mean, how can you be six feet apart and see the same screen? Um, uh well, you're not going to see the same screen. We, we each had our own computers. And believe me, we had masks on. And they stayed on the whole time. <laughs> right. Well, and I would think, though, that for a person who's still not confident yet in doing virtual judging, if they even if one was in the kitchen and one was in an office, for example, at least if there was a technical glitch, somebody would be there to help them get through that technical glitch. So it might be a nice intermediate step for a person who's just new, brand new at doing this. You, you mentioned that you... Uh, had had a request that we have, would it be allowable to have one judge be in a gym and one judge be at home? So talk to us about that. Why would you want to do that? I've, I've had this conversation with a lot of meat directors. One of the things that they came to me is that they feel like that the kids feel like it's more of a real meat when they see the judge sitting there. Okay. Um, the, the, so I just tell them it's perfectly acceptable, but think through the logistics that if you're using multiple locations and that judge is on site at one location, they have to flip to virtual mm -hmm. to see the other locations. Mm -hmm. So they just have to think through those mechanics. And so if that judge is judging more than one event, they have to switch events, then they have to switch virtual. So there is um, there is more involved with that. And it's so it's not that you can't do it, but it's not going to be, if, if it's a hybrid meet, at some point that on-site judge is gonna be judging virtually. Okay, so now I'm judging, how do I know the gymnast is getting ready, to, is ready to compete? Like, how do I signal the, the gymnast? How do I know that the gymnast is running down the runway for vault? Okay, so for vaulting, um, what we did was the judge would signal you know, from, her, from her computer, and then the coach would hold her or his hand up and when the girls started to run, they would drop the hand so then we can anticipate, okay, she's about to come and approach the board shortly. And then the others, they pretty much, um, if the gymnast didn't see us, depending upon the camera angle, then the coach would just tell the girl that it was time to go. Okay. And one of the things I've been impressing upon the meet directors is it's very important for, uh, the, um, for all the different geographical locations that they have an on-site facilitator with the camera that can easily um, speak back and forth to the judges and to the meet director and all of that. Um, and that's what's really helped us. So if the gymnast couldn't see the head judge, they can facilitate that. Well, and one thing that I found when I was observing the region seven meet, but it was really very clear and very helpful uh, to know which gymnast was going. So you all had rotation sheets and then the coach would say, this is 107, this is Susie Smith. And then the judge would verify that. And some, a couple of times there had been a change in order or a scratch or something. And so you were, had the opportunity to correct it. So it seemed very simple to know and to keep track of who was going to be the athlete who was competing and to be sure you were judging the correct athlete. Linda set, set us all up so we were comfortable, feeling just like it was a regular meet. She had the rotations down. So um, it takes that little bit of pre-work, that organizational pre-work that... Uh, Linda is so good at that really helps that piece. And who's so, going to do that usually? Is that going to be the meet director? The meet director, yeah. Um, so it's that's important that the, the that the judges have the athlete numbers and rotation orders in advance. Now I happen to send it out the day before. It could just be you know during the open stretch even. But we also had um, the head judges maintained a manual heat sheet and having that rotation list ahead of time was easy for them to then create their heat sheet um, to main, so we had a manual backup basically. And then they, um, 
emailed or texted that um, heat sheet to the, me, the meat director at the end of the mm -hmm. uh, competition. Okay. Um, I used the sheet that Linda had sent us and I put um, the two judges scores on it with the average. And then at the end of the meet, I just took um, a picture of it with my phone and then I just sent it to Linda. Okay, so now when we move into optional season, one of the things judges are going to want to know is how do I flash my start value? Well, I think Linda's going to show us right now. Um, we did the same thing with neutral deductions. With the neutral deduction flip pad, we yes. just held it up. they just held it up. Okay. So in Zoom, you have the option to have a private chat or a group chat. And so uh, would you recommend that we would put our start values and scores, if that's the vehicle we're going to use for that. I'll put that in as a private chat or as an open chat. That would be an open chat because people want to see it. So if you put it in a private chat, you're just showing it to yourself and your other judge. Okay, so now how do we turn in scores? We've mentioned ProScore. And so um, not I found that not everybody has used ProScore before. So there was some training that may, was needed to be done and for a couple of judges at least. Use what are the other methods you can use if you're not going to use ProScore? In the ones I've done where we didn't have access to ProScore, we've just used the chat room. We have a very specific format um, because the athletes are at that point in different breakout rooms. So they would, the judge would enter 101, vault, tano, slash 88. And we would use that format all the way through. So we could, if there was a, if we were using the chat room, that could almost serve as a paper trail, you know. And as you said, that can be used as a paper trail because at least in Zoom, you can download the chat if it's a public chat, uh, open right. group chat. Right. So that's another good way of doing it. And one of the things I noticed when I, again, when I was observing is that Bonnie and, and some of the other chief judges, they were very good about saying this average out loud too. And to me, that was really helpful to the uh, coach because then the coach can communicate that to the athlete too. How do you, uh, judges conference if they need to conference? You can do it through chat, you know, if it's simple. And, and in that case, the conference would want to be a private chat. If it's a complicated one, then you might want to have a conversation. But if you're going to do that, you surely want to mute yourself on Zoom so that the people aren't hearing your conversation. The playbook, is, I think, reads right now, at least, uh, inquiries were not going to be allowed. But yesterday, we were talking to Christy. And I think all of us as judges know that we sometimes make mistakes and we really value the inquiry process to give us an opportunity to correct those mistakes. So I think there, that's one of the questions, Christy, that I think you, know, you and Connie are gonna be talking with the other uh, people who are involved in making these decisions to see if we can't develop a procedure to allow inquiries. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think, you know, as we started this whole virtual competition thought process. It was one of those inquiries where one of those things where it just, oh my gosh, how are we going? To, there's not a mechanism for that. How are we going to develop that? And so, you know, as we're looking to be flexible and we want to make this easy and user-friendly, that was the first thought. Well, no inquiries. However, if we can develop something um, that will help with that process, then I don't see any reason why we wouldn't want to move forward with with allowing inquiries. It's okay. I think that also it's it's not just the judge that wants to be, have, be able to correct if they made an error, but there's a lot of times a coach will inquire and you explain to them something that they didn't ha have a good understanding about and or they were missing something that they didn't realize they were missing and you can correct it early in the season before they get to state meet or, or regional meet. So I think it goes both ways. It's gonna it's it's a help to both the coach and the judge. And if we can find a way to facilitate it, I think it's really crucial to yeah. try to do that. I agree. And I think so for the judges who are watching this, this is one of the reasons that we need to constantly look at the revised and updated playbooks when it comes out, because this might be something that will change. It would, for us, I think it would be a welcome change for the reasons mm -hmm. uh, we already discussed. Um, so Connie, then if we do get to have an inquiry process, then I, was, I would assume we would also get to have um, video review in the cases where video review would be already applicable and allowable in the rules and policies. Right, and, and we just 
change that rule that we can have video review at any meet now and not just at state meet and above. And so it'll in live situation, if there's somebody that videotaped it, you know, it would have to rely on the coach or a parent or somebody that had uh, something of that athlete. One of the things I'm very excited about is the possibility of pairing Flip 10 with Zoom for this very reason. Right. Um, it helps with technical breakdowns. It's going to help with uh, video inquiries. It kind of glues everything together. But that still requires that somebody's doing that extra videotaping on site at each of those locations. Mm -hmm. But most coaches do that anyway because the kids yeah. are maintaining, or at least at the upper optional levels, they have their um, you know, NCAA portfolios that they're keeping together for their websites or whatever they're building. So a lot of times they're already videotaping their routine. Just one more thing. There's the, uh, the club in New Mexico that um, has the dual tripod. So they have one um, iPad on the tripod that is the Zoom camera. And right next to that is a second device, whether it's an, a phone or an, another iPad that is just recording. So it's very consistently done. Every routine is shown through Zoom, but it's right there with the exact same view and it's recorded through that second device. It's a really cool setup. All right, let's move to the role of the meet referee. So in the virtual playbook, it does say, of course, that one of the judges is designated as the meet referee. And I can, I'd like to have just a conversation back and forth about having a separate meet referee versus one who is a judging meet referee. And what do you think is the best practice for virtual meets? I think for virtual meet, the separate meet referee is ideal, especially now with Zoom, where the meet referee can come in and out of the rooms at will. The meet that Bonnie was talking about, she had texted me, can you come into the beam room? So it was very simple. I just hopped in and um, it doesn't disturb anyone else. No one else has to come off their event to help. So I, that's just my opinion. I think a separate meet referee, especially with something new that we're just starting like this where technical issues can happen. It's nice to have that support right there. And if we get to do inquiries, the mm -hmm. meet referee can be referee. really help in terms of uh, processing those inquiries with the judges too. Yeah, I, I think if we can make it work, having a separate meet referee would be the, the, the way to go. Oh, I, th I think when we're first starting out like this, it's, it's almost essential, you know, if you really want it to run smoothly. Uh, maybe when we're more professional, but right now we need it. <laughs> yes, I, I know when that happened right away, I'm like, Jane, Jane, where are you? And just having that extra person there made us feel a lot more confident. That's mm -hmm. great. Connie, I yeah. have a question for you. So what is the compensation process for judges here? Well, if it's it's being run like uh, live, uh, like the re the one that I've observed from Region Seven, you would do just what you would do at a live uh, meet or in person meet. And uh, Jerry Foley developed a couple of products that are on our website for meet referees, and one is an Excel spreadsheet. But basically, it calculates everything for um, the meet director and the, in terms of the fees. And uh, but she also has that an app that you can use. And I think it's only available for iPhones right now, but there's two other resources that me for referees can use. Is there anything else that you can think of before we summarize our comments for judges today? Okay. Just having the opportunity to try it before it counts. That's all. It's just having that opportunity to try it. Okay. Well, and I was just gonna say that things are going to happen and you just deal with them as best you can at that time. Okay. Things happen in regular meets, so this is <laughs> <not> <laughs> different. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. The sun comes in and this way, yeah, believe me, we've dealt with all of it. <laughs> Some of the things that we talked about today, um, virtual meets will be assigned in the same way that judges are assigned to in-person meets. The kinds of equipment judges need, they need some kind of a computer, either a laptop or a desktop so that they can actually see the routine that's being performed. And then depending on how they're gonna turn in their scores, they may need an iPad to download the app from ProScore so that at least one of the judges has the ability to turn in scores. Factors other than equipment that judges should take into account is certainly they need to have very strong and consistent Wi-Fi 
or they should contact Myra and or watch her uh, super ethernet cable <laughs> video that she's getting ready to post uh, so that we'll all know how to hardwire our computers so that we would have more consistent Wi-Fi access. But also our judges want to be have a judging environment that's going to allow for uh, in, intense private viewing of these routines. And judges can judge either one at home and one in a gym. Both can be at home. Or and in fact, we said that if it helps for some reason, judges and they feel safe doing it, they could actually go to one person's house and judge together. But in that situation, they need to maintain the same professional standards that you would at a meet. Speaking of professional standards, the judges will wear their uniforms, at least for the parts that are going to show on the video performance. Uh, and then judges will know when the athlete is approaching or ready to go because the judge will signal like they uh, always do. And then there'll be somebody in the gym who will make sure that the athlete sees the hand raising either by uh, paralleling the arm raise uh, and notifying the judges on vault in particular of when that athlete is on her way down to, to vault. And flashing your start value, same way we usually do it, except you may have to hold it up to the screen and also the neutral deduction book. You may have to hold that up to the screen. The ways that you can communicate with your fellow judge in terms of start value and score could either be through the chat room. And in that case, for this start value and score, you would put that in the open chat so that the coaches could see it as well. But if you're going to have to have a conference, you would either do that through the private chat or you might call one another or text one another so that if, if it's a more complex question that can be handled through the chat room. Uh, keeping track of scores, they do that in the same way that we ordinarily do. We'll have our list of athletes in the order that they are uh, going to compete in, at the intended order. And if that changes, the coach is going to let us know. Right now, we're waiting to find out if it's going to be possible to have inquiries. If it is, the procedure will be added, I'm sure, to the playbook. Uh, judges will sign the sanction virtually. And then the payment process, I think we already talked about. So I think we've gone all the way from the start to the end. And any last words before we stop our video recording? I did turn on record, right? <laughs> oh, no. yes. I looked up there, but I don't see it blinking. Recording. <laughs> so, okay, do y'all mind saying another hour so we can do this all over again? <laughs> no, it, it is on and it is recording. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for those of you who are watching this. Uh, be sure and keep watching the USA Gymnastics website and re reviewing the updates as they come along for the virtual playbook. And uh, we hope this is a one-time occurrence for this year, um, but uh, we're all, we seem prepared. And it's remember, it's just all about the gymnasts and the, the hope that they can have a season that will allow them to continue their development in the sport that they love and the, the sport that we love to judge.